Okay, so I think you know this, but senior promotion does not refer to going from lecturer to assistant professor. It's either assistant to associate or associate full, to full professor. Next slide. <laughs> Um, so what I'm going to talk about this morning are, are the criteria, eligibility and criteria, um, key elements of the candidate statement, which is really, in our opinion, the most important thing for you to focus on and which is required for your hospital first review, hospital division first review, and then the timeline. The timeline uh, Colin has finalized for this next cycle, um, the PICs and DDDs all have the new timeline. It's online, but I haven't updated in the slide deck, so I'm, I'm going to correct that at the end. Next slide. And please interrupt me if you have any questions. Okay, so let's start with eligibility for senior promotion. Uh, next slide, please. A lot of people get confused with this. I'm just moving you guys around my slides. Um, so you must demonstrate excellence as defined by the decanal, the Temerty Faculty of Medicine, the university, in at least one of research, creative professional activity, or teaching. When it's teaching, we call it sustained excellence in teaching. Many, 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 many of you do more than one of these things. But to keep life simple, pick one that you're really sure you demonstrate excellence. We can always say that you're excellent in research and competent in CPA, competent in teaching, et cetera. But to just focus on the thing that you feel your strongest is the easiest. With respect to research and CPA, effectively, the decanal committee defines excellence as you have achieved a reputation nationally for associate and internationally for full professor. That is not that you have had impact nationally or internationally. It's that you have a reputation for your body of scholarly work at a national level, at an international level, and you must have external referees who are unrelated to you, not in conflict with you, who say, yeah, I know this dude's work and it is incredible, it's influenced how we practice, it's changed the way we think about, whatever. For sustained excellence in teaching, it's an internal process where we look at your overall excellence of teaching, and we'll define that, but we define it based on lots of different metrics, unfortunately, heavily weighted to student uh, evaluations, training evaluations, and I'll speak about that. But you also have testimonials from students. And then the most beautiful things I get to read in every year. You have internal referees that attest to the body of your teaching and that is excellent. And sustain is where that 10 year guideline came up that they want to see that you're not an excellent teacher one year or two years, but over a succession of years. Everybody has to demonstrate competence as a teacher. So no matter how brilliant you are as a researcher, doesn't matter if you aren't a good teacher and we need to demonstrate that. You must have given back something to the university, your society, um, your organizations, but at minimum, we expect you to have given something back to your department, your division, your hospital. And it is not a requirement of the decanal committee, but it is a requirement of this department that you must demonstrate professional behavior consistent with our code of conduct, the university's code of conduct. And we have denied promotion or not sent people forward to the decanal committee simply based on persistent unprofessional behavior. Several of those people have received, not several, there aren't that many, but they have received coaching and have come back and been successfully promoted. There is something we're gonna add this year, again, our department, not the decanal committee, but if you're going forward on full, for full, perform, full, full promotion, full professor promotion based on excellence in research, we expect you to have trained graduate students. So somebody who is a clinician scientist, who has a body of research, who has exclusively 
supervised residents and fellows, we will not consider to have done their job in terms of the giving back, feeding forward, doing their job as a scientist, which includes to build the next generation of scientists, particularly in the field. And I'll come back to that. Next slide, please. And again, interrupt. I'm gonna give you lots of opportunities to interrupt. There's something called the Manual for Academic Promotion. It gets tweaked a little bit by the Decanal Committee every year, pretty minimally. We haven't received an update, Colin, correct me, but I haven't seen anything new from the Decanal Committee um, for this year. It sits on our website. I would strongly, strongly recommend, if not tell you, you have to read the thing according to the cri criteria that you're going forward for promotion. So the answers to most questions are there. Um, in particular, people often ask, well, how do you demonstrate impact? And I'm going to talk about this for CPA. It is really nicely laid out in the Manual for Academic Promotion. If you have questions, then bring them to us. But please take a good look at the Manual for Academic Promotion. Next slide, please. It's on our website. It's on the faculty's website. Okay. CPA, I can't see you, um, but I think some of you, but not all of you know what creative professional activity is, but I'm gonna do a little uh, ad for the Department of Medicine. It was actually Charlie Hollenberg, who was a chair many, many moons ago, who introduced the concept of creative professional activity um, as a mechanism for promotion. And I think we are really lucky as a university um, to have CPA in addition to research and education as a criterion. So what is CPA? CPA are activities, I simplify it as anything that you do that advances your professional practice. So whether it's improving the way you diagnose, improving the way you treat, improving the education of clinicians, improving the knowledge dissemination to clinicians, changing patient uptake adherence to their uh, treatment regimen. It's all of those things. So it's very wide open. The faculty defines it in three bins, contributions to the development of professional practices, such as leadership in professional societies, associations, organizations that influence standards. And many of us, many of you are leads in guidelines development, policies often. Sometimes you're influencing policy at a government level around access to a medication or a treatment or um, appropriate use of uh, a modality. Um, that is all contribute contributions to the development of professional practices. Exemplary professional practice is practice that's recognized by peers as exemplary and has been emulated. We have 550 fellows, 70% of them come from other countries. Many, many of them go back to their countries and establish a program or a practice they learned here with you. So as you think about your footprint and how big it has grown, you need to think about, wow, look at all the people I've trained to do blah that has built this, this clinical capacity um, across the world. And we have many people who've done this. So that would be exemplary professional practice. Another example of exemplary professional practice would be somebody that's become the expert on weird and wonderful disease X. So people from around the world consult Dr. So-and-so because they're the go-to expert on the diagnosis and management of this condition. And again, we have many people like that. The third category is professional innovation and creative excellence. And again, we have lots of this. So inventions, new techniques, conceptual innovations, educational programs. So somebody might have developed a series of narrated whiteboard videos to uh, educate their society, their population, patients about something. Somebody may have a blog that has become 
incredibly important for disseminating evidence-based information. We have, we have individuals in our department who've developed websites for their societies that have become the go-to evidence um, for the world and have been endorsed by national and international societies. So all of the developing new curriculum for point of care ultrasound, developing new curriculum for whatever it is, all of that CPA. So I used to say you don't need to decide which bucket this falls into, but I've learned over the last nine years that it makes a difference to the decanal committee if you just call it what it is. So I would say as much as possible, well, I want you to focus on trying to link your activities to these three buckets. You, you can have more than one bucket, but you don't need to have all three buckets. You just have to have a body of scholarly work in one of these buckets. At the end, thank you, Colin. At the end of the, of the manual is a CPA checklist. The decanal committee uses this checklist. Our committee uses this checklist. So it will walk th you through what we expect to see and you will produce a CPA dossier as part of your promotions process. It spits out from WebCV. We are the only department using WebCV at this point, but yours will spit out, provided you've done a good job with your um, CV. But you need to make sure that you've answered all of these questions. Not that hard, but you know, you've know you got a clear career statement, that's your CPA statement in your CV and in the dossier that you're gonna provide, that you've got a vision statement. You know, Why am I doing what I'm doing? And I'm gonna come back to that when we talk about telling your story. So checklist in the handbook, you need to follow it. Next slide. Colin, sorry. Our department also has done things a little bit differently um, because we feel there are limitations to the traditional metrics, which are number of grants, size of grants, funding body, journal impact factor, citations. Citations is probably the one that I think we probably agree with the most, but there is so much variability across our fields. I'm an osteoarthritis researcher. The ability to publish in the New England is pretty small. I have done it, not recently. Um, and our best journal has an impact factor. What, Nigel, I'm looking at you, nine, maybe? So, you know, like we can't compare cardiovascular trials to, you know, osteoarthritis epidemiology. And so what we ask you to do is go past those metrics that we're looking for impact. And this is about your narrative. So what is the body of scholarly work that has been deemed important by your peers and has had or has potential to have an impact on health or healthcare of the population? So maybe you developed a new measure of your disease activity, let's just say. And that new measure has been endorsed by the international societies and now is required for clinical trials in, in your disease. And by doing that, you have shifted the, the requirements for drug approval such that patient quality of life is now critical to the approval of a drug. That's pretty darn important, but you might not think of it that way. So again, we're gonna come back to telling your story. Next slide. I think I already said this, keep going. There's another animation, keep going. Okay, now we're gonna shift from CPA and research really to teaching because there are a lot of myths about teaching. You can put them all up. So I mentioned sustained. Our department was successful in finally badgering the decanal committee to agree that they would consider somebody before 10 years on the basis for promotion on the basis of sustained excellence in teaching. If they met these criteria, I will tell you that we have had 
many people go forward on sustained excellence in teaching at seven, eight, and nine years. I always have to go defend them, but we've got every single one of them through. So I'm not, I don't want to keep pushing the envelope, but we've got many excellent teachers and there's no reason they should wait to 10 years if they fulfill the criteria at seven or eight or nine. I would say eight or nine is probably our average time to promotion for all the position descriptions. And I'm trying to get our teachers to the same place that everybody else is. So it has to be sustained excellence and we'll come back to the definition. The quantity of the teaching needs to align with whatever your position description is, which is irrelevant to the decanal committee, but relevant to the department review. So if you're a teacher, you are expected to be teaching at the undergraduate and postgraduate levels. It, that's a minimum. You're expected to be doing formal teaching. That is outside of clinical care. That's the stuff that makes you no money, but is critically important. And in the context of clinical care, you have different opportunities for that. Some of you are in really sub, sub, sub specialized fields where you don't see undergraduate students, you mostly see fellows, you still are expected to do undergraduate teaching. You're still expected to be providing some service to undergraduate education. So you should be looking at the levels. Um, many of you also do continuing education, but you're not expected as a teacher to be doing graduate supervision. Most researchers aren't going on sustained excellence in teaching, but researchers are expected to be doing whatever is needed to support their, their division. So sometimes that is undergrad. You're all expected to do residency and fellowship teaching in the context of clinical care, but the emphasis of your teaching should be on graduate supervision. The quality of your teaching is at least at the medium for peers. And this is where we have a heck of a problem because our median for most of our disciplines across most of our hospitals is 4.4, 4.5. So it's pretty hard to say that a teacher who scores in the excellent range is not excellent when that is a score of four or higher. So it's, it's a bit twisted. Our scores are high. We have very non-normally distributed scores. In our department, the 10th percentile for scores, so that means the lowest 10% hit 3.75 and below. So that is the flag in our department. But for these guys at the decanal committee, they're looking for scores that are consistently above four and consistently at at or above the median, you know, on your, on your teaching scores, it'll say for your hospital, for your discipline. They want to see that you're at least at, if not above the median for peers. They do that based on your scores and the comments, and we can come back to comments and scores that are not fair or inappropriate whether you've received honors or awards for your teaching, recognition for your teaching, creative innovations and in how teaching is provided. So to some extent, it's CPA in teaching, but as you've evolved your teaching skills, many of you have developed very creative new things. And then your teaching statement, um, which is really how you approach teaching. How have you evolved your teaching? How do you reflect on your teaching evaluations and seek um, efforts to improve? And then finally, as I mentioned, um, you are required to have three student testimonials. I don't think anybody's had three student testimonials. We asked you to give us eight names. Um, we've had records of, I think we've now had 11, 12 student testimonials on individuals that are incredible. I wish I could share them with the promotion candidates, but students actually say incredibly beautiful things like this person changed my life. This person is still a mentor and I'm you know, five years into faculty appointment in the community. And like, it's, it's tremendous and that counts a lot. We use the quotes of those students a lot. 
And then finally, we were able to get rid of external referee letters for sustained excellence in teaching, but you do need three internal referee letters. And it's a bit convoluted how the decanal committee has determined who you need to get them from. But generally speaking, these are just colleagues in the university who need to say, yeah, this dossier indicates that this person has demonstrated sustained excellence in teaching. Colin, next slide. I'm gonna break in a second, so you've got it. So reputation is not impact. It's based on your referee letters and choose wisely does not mean choosing wisely. Choose wisely means you want to solicit. You're not gonna solicit anything. You're gonna give us names and your DDDs give us names of people that we can ask for uh, uh, letters from. They do not need to know you, and we'll come back to that. Um, and we're really looking for their opinion about the body of your work. We also look at leadership roles. Have you been invited to chair or co-chair, a guideline, a committee, an overview, a task force? Your role in whatever this is, is important. Being invited to participate in something is nice. What they're looking for is leadership roles. It might be that there's a big guideline and you are invited to chair a chapter or a topic. That's fine. But they're looking for leadership, which indicates that somebody or your society came to you and said, you're the expert in this area. We want you to lead this. And then invited national and international presentations. That could be invitations to give a keynote at a meeting. It could be invitations to give grand rounds at a, another university. You could be invited as a visiting professor. It is not, or invited to consult. It's not podium presentations for submitted abstracts. It is invitations to present. And again, very long list in the handbook. Next slide. And I know there's a comment or a question in the chat. Hang on two secs. So Alexandra has said, in addition to power-based scores, some programs have a lot of teaching that's not recorded on power. Uh, yeah, we'll take everything. Um, many of you are using MyTE, and we do use MyTE, even though it is not officially acknowledged by the faculty. We use it regularly. The evaluations we won't include are things that you solicited yourself. So Emerge used to give people sort of cards at the end of the day and say, fill them out. We can't do that. We need formal evaluations. So if you've given a workshop or a session or your formal teaching uh, or rounds and you've got an evaluation where it's arm's length, we will use all of that. Um, if you're going for full professor, we really want those external referees to be international, ideally. Yeah, there. I'm going to come back to all of that. Yep, keep going. Karen, I'll come back. Next slide. Because I think I've got a break coming up. The most important thing from an external referee is not to regurgitate what you put in your, in your dossier, but to tell us that the work you've done has made a big difference um, and that it's changed or influenced their practice or it's changed or influenced the field that you work in, et cetera. That's what we're looking for. And they're generally pretty good at it. Our DDDs are extremely helpful in helping us find the right people for you. But you need to do some homework to think about who are the people out there who they don't need to know you. They have to be able to look at your dossier, dossier and, and, and hopefully know your work through listening to you present, reading your papers as, as, as referees on journals, et cetera, and be able to say, yeah, this has been important work. Next slide. So I, I want you to do a little exercise and then Karen, I'm gonna come back to you. If someone that you haven't met is in your field, 
were asked to write a referee letter. So if you're associate, somebody in Canada, pick someone in another province or another university in Ontario who's asked to write an external referee letter for you. For those of you thinking about sustained excellence in teaching, pick somebody in a different department in a different hospital. Would they know your name? Would they know your work? Would they have heard about you? Would they read your dossier and say, wow, this is, this is really impressive. And would they say that you've demonstrated a national or international reputation if you're going for research or CPA or for sustained excellence in teaching? Yes, this is sustained excellence in teaching. And I, I want you to take a couple of, couple of, like a half a minute you have to be able to come up with at least five names of people that you think would write you a good letter that you don't know that you haven't worked with and work your mentors. And, you know, I think sometimes people don't go through that exercise seriously enough. This is a are you ready workshop. We do a promotions workshop once you've gone through the hospital. But this is really a are you ready. This is kind of key. So particularly for obviously our CPA and research folks, some person in Saskatchewan in your field should be able to look at your dossier and say, yeah, I've heard about this work. It's important. And, you know, this is, this is good stuff. And that, that's what you're looking for. Okay. Um, What's the next slide, Colin? Okay, last, last one on this, and then I'm going to break for a sec. So administrative service is required for all of us. It doesn't get you promoted, um, but it is, as I said, a requirement. So citizenship is not the stuff that you do to advance your own career. It's... It's the stuff you do for the group. It's the stuff that takes you away from doing the stuff for your own career. So sitting on your hospital REB, sitting on a CIHR grant review panel, being a Royal College examiner, sitting on your division's CARM selection committee, organizing rounds for a journal club or whatever. Those are the things we're getting at. Not, I'm a deputy editor on my journal, I am the president of my association. I am, you know, those are things that actually advance your career. This is the stuff we're looking for. So sitting on a committee. Yep, I'm gonna come back to all the questions. Next, Colin. Because we're gonna pause. I think there's just a finish up. What's next? Oh, the decadal committee doesn't care what your position description is, whether you're a teacher or a scientist, we use that as a lens at the Department Promotions Committee, but it's irrelevant. What they're looking at is, have you met the criteria for excellence uh, in the plank that you say, or planks that you say you're going forward? Next slide. Oh, this is just showing you and in fact, I've updated this to 2023 from 2014. We have had 357 people go through promotion um, from 2014, uh, 239 of them. So about two thirds have gone to associate and a third have gone to full professor. The time to promotion is pretty much eight, nine years, 10 for teachers. And I've already said we're trying to work on leveling that. Um, most of the sustained excellence in teaching is clinician educators and clinician teachers. CIs go 50-50. Um, the uh, CPA and research and our scientists are almost exclusively research. Our TCTs, I think I maybe I didn't say it, are half, pretty much half sustained excellence in teaching and half CPA. Next slide. Keep thinking I've got a break coming. Uh, questions coming. Yeah, keep going. Uh, doesn't matter. Keep going. 
Okay, so let me let me close for a second, or or can you stop sharing for a second, Colin? And I'm just going to go to the questions, and remind me how much time we have. Yep, we are Colin, about we... 17 minutes remaining or so. Okay, okay. So I'm going to go to the questions. And, uh, up just a couple questions about referees in the chat there. Yeah, no, I'm going to go up to Karen and go to go through. So what about evaluations from grad students? Um, we've been arguing with SGS for years to give us evaluations. We get very few. You may have teaching evaluations from your graduate teaching. We'll take anything you've got that's official, but currently we don't get anything from people you're supervising. Um, peer review activities for journals are seen as citizenship. That is absolutely part of the, we are, it doesn't get you promoted, but it's absolutely accounts towards pro, uh, professional contributions to being a good citizen. Charles has asked, does it have to be someone you've never met? No, you can know the person that's providing a letter. You cannot have worked with them. Like meaning we will always do pub, you should do PubMed searches to make sure you're not showing up on the same, um, same publication. We always get asked, yeah, but I was on a guideline or a trial where there were 50 authors. That is okay if that's all of the people that you know in your rare disease world, we will, we will explain. However, you should strive to have people that you've not published with. And it's, you know, if you've got a good dossier, somebody that's in a related field can still review it. Um, but no, you don't have to. You could have met the person, you could have served on a large committee with the person, but not actually work directly with them as a researcher or a CPA or whatever. There, um, yes, you cannot have published in the last five years. So you could have published with them more than five years ago, but they can never have served as a supervisor or a mentor. So somebody that you, were supervised by in your PhD or in your master's or was a close mentor in your M M while you were an MD student, they're out. And do us all a favor, because poor Colin right now is in the process of getting hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of letters. Um, do your due diligence on finding the right uh, potential referees. Do not contact anybody. Bindi is asking, are referees restricted to individuals we've never, I just answered that. Um, just to clarify, it has to be someone we've never met. No, you can have met them. Um, I always hear, yep, uh, I always hear about rare disease. We've, we don't generally have a problem. There, it, there are enough people. And what I say is, think about the people that you have worked with. Ask them, who, you know, don't ask them. Think about who they work with at their institution. There are people that are around the people that you know that are very likely to be able to comment on you. And I think Charles, that was your point too. Um, Nigel, um, when we co-author on large trials, yeah, I, it's, it's fine, but try to avoid it. Um, I still remember Claire Bombardier going for full professor and she had nothing but huge publications and, with 400 people. We can make the argument, um, but, Try to avoid that. Uh, can the CPA be an extension of the one we use for CFAR? Uh, CFAR is irrelevant to promotion. It's the date of assistant professor. They don't have anything to do with one another. CFAR was your probationary review. This is what have you done from assistant professor to now? And the other is from the date. We actually take January of the year of associate professor to now. Okay, CFAR is irrelevant. And you can be promoted forward on the same, uh, same body of work, but it should be new work that you're going forward for when you're going from to full professor. So it has to be the area under the curve since you got to the previous, your current rank. Um, do we review the list of referees? Yep, your DDD will work with you, your PIC a little bit, but mostly it's your DDD and a mentor that will be assigned to you. They will go over the list. 
they put people on the list, you put people on the list. It can't all be people that you come up with. We do some fancy footwork to solve that. But basically, um, yes, we spent a lot of time on this. Um, people are tired out there. Um, it's a lot of asking. Um, we have huge volumes and, of, of people needing referee letters. And so it's, it really is a major task. So the minimum I ask of you is to put, I've already said this, put effort into thinking about who goes on your list. Do your PubMed searches, make sure they're nowhere in the last five years, ideally co-publishing with you. And if they are, and that's all you can come up with, you better have a good explanation as to why they're on the list. Okay, so I'm going to pause other questions. Colin, I don't remember what was next slide wise. Dora measure is being used to evaluate research impact. Um, yes, in our department, no, at the decanal committee. So does it, I mean, everybody may not know what DORA is. Uh, uh, DORA is really just getting at the, what I said at the very beginning, which is that traditional metrics are biased. It very much is influenced, thank you. It's very much influenced by your field, your available journals, um, the type of research you do, um, and uh, it doesn't really take into consideration the challenges uh, and barriers you've had to getting funding. And uh, so long and the short of it is um, the, the um, we do. Um, Gemini's asking something that just flashed by me. Um, timeline measured from last promotion to now the end of the cycle. If you decide to go forward for promotion in this cycle, yes, you would be being promoted in 2025, but your dossier would come in at the beginning of 2025. So effectively it's everything up until then, but you have an opportunity between let's say January and when we actually submit the documents, which is not until December to update if there's something critical that happens. If you secure, secure anything you do that's relevant in the time period when you're under review, we can update. And we ask you to update us about stuff that's important. And absolutely, uh, patents and licenses are considered um, both <laughs> CPA, the work is CPA, and, um, and that is impact. Um, with someone who has about one of tw approximately 20 people who were on the National Licensing Exam Committee, would you count as a professional? No, probably not. There are lots of big committees society-wise, um, as long as, again, they weren't too close. They weren't your co-chair. They weren't co-leading with you some body of work that took five years that you spent a hell of a lot of time on. Okay, in light of the time, I'm going to just flip to, to what's your story. We do a separate workshop on what's your story. We do a full workshop on senior promotion that is also recorded and is also last one from last year is sitting on our website. So you're welcome to go there. That is a much longer document. This is the intent of today is high level. Are you ready? The job for you, if you want to be considered for 2025 will be to create your candidate statement and update your CV. That's it for your hospital divisional review, which will happen in the fall. So I want to talk about the candidate statement. Um, next slide, please. So I think our department has really, really, um, really helped itself by focusing on your narrative. Um, it makes it much easier, frankly, to do advancement um, philanthropy. And it's also kind of easier for you to have an elevator pitch and be able to talk to your societies or donors or whatever about what you do. So we want you to be able to tell your story and you do that through your candidate statement. So we want you to be able to say, what is the focus of your scholarly work? Why is it important? Um, and how are you achieving those goals? Um, in lay 
language. Yes, lay language so that your 12 year old child could read it or your neighbor who doesn't have any medical background could read it and understand it. I know there are some of you who are very fundamental basic scientists, but if I can't read it and have a clue what you're doing, it's not doing the job. You have to, you know, this is understanding the mechanism by which muscles become weak and don't regenerate after ICU care. I'm saying that because that was one of the last ones that I understood it. Okay, next slide. So the candidate statement, Hold on. Yeah, we've already said that. Okay, maybe I've said all of this already. Okay, keep going. Yeah. Okay, it's not the slide I thought it was. So let me just pause for a second. Okay, you can leave it there. So effectively, the candidate statements with, starts with, who are you? I am a rheumatologist and clinician scientist at such and such a hospital who for the last 10 years has been focused on advancing access and improved outcomes of care for people living with osteoarthritis. I know that's the game. Why is this important? Osteoarthritis is by far the most common condition affecting the joints and is rapidly exponentially increasing. It's the third most common disabling condition globally behind diabetes and dementia. So I'm not gonna go through all of these slides. We don't have time, but there are many examples. 